Hello everyone, I'm Michael and it is February 20th, 2024 and it is 4.41 p.m. and it was hot today so I thought I'd come out and um, talk about something that I've been wanting to talk about for at least a month, for at least a month, but between the cold weather and other situations, it just wasn't an ideal time for that. So, here in the United States, it is Black History Month, right? And as an Afro-Indigenous American with Caribbean roots, I have to say that it is good that a people is recognized and celebrated. And as many things that has occurred with Afro-Indigenous people and Afro-descended people in this country and elsewhere in the world, it's important to reflect on how we got to this place and time. And so that is not the topic today, but it would be remiss of me to not give mention to that, um, given the importance of this month and what it means to all of us, whether we're Afro-descendant or not, right? And as an Afro-Indigenous American, right, you know, I have a special connection to America, to the land, and where it came from, where it has been, and where it may go in the future, right? And so, I'm descended from peoples that had ruled the land of America way before Christopher Columbus, right? And so I have a special connection and stewardship with this land we call America. But I wanna talk about a connection of a different type. And I have been wanting to talk about this connection uh, that we call Neuralink for about a month, right? But we've had some ice, we've had some snow, we've had some weather events. I've had some personal events, as usual. That's, you know, that's life, right? And today was one of the few, what you might call, hot days um, earlier in the day. It's kind of chilled out a little bit now. And so, you know, I was weighing whether I wanted to come out here and talk about what I am going to talk about today, uh, simply because recording outside has its pros and cons. You have the sun directly there, and I love getting my sun gaze right now while I'm having this discussion, but it can also have an impact on recording equipment. But what I wanted to talk about is Neuralink. I'm gonna talk about Neuralink, right? And the reason why this is important to me is because this is a time capsule. What I'm recording here is a bit of a time capsule. It's a snapshot in time about some things that I am quite sure will happen in the future. And I just want to put the conversation out there. Um, I am not one who believes that, that there's so many things in life that is unique. I'm not one of those individuals. I think if you've ever come up with an idea my belief is that somebody else also came up with that idea. I don't believe in unique ideas, but there is such thing as who announced it first, right? Who put it into practice uh, first, you know, in a more widespread way. And so this conversation, I'm pretty sure someone else has already had. I just ain't ran across it yet. So because of that, I'm going to go ahead and have it. So what triggered this conversation was an, a private conversation I had with my relatives about Neuralink. Uh, because we were talking about, you know, the, the first successful human uh, trial, as it were, uh, if that's the right, right word for it. But, you know, uh, they had a successful uh, result from implanting a chip into a human brain. And, you know, this chip is designed to enhance the human brain 
right? You put a chip in your brain and you can enhance the brain the way you can think. Well, let's just say that at least the wide opinion is that it's primarily a left brain enhancement, you know. But I'm sure with what we see with artificial intelligence and Dali and Sora and AI generated images and video and art that we can see some right brain crossover as well in the future. But the discussion was, you know, does Neuralink represent an elevation in consciousness, right? Does it move us towards a higher humanity? Um, you know, and then you can extrapolate from that, you know, if we merge the mind with the machines, we will achieve a type of super consciousness, right? So, you know, and the discussion somewhat reminded me of that anime series that I love so much. I, I actually bought the entire set at one point, uh, Ghost in the Shell. Uh, Ghost in the Shell is Japanese anime. And for those that don't know, yes, in the past, I was quite into uh, Japanese anime. And so, um, Ghost in the Shell was one of my favorites. I especially like that theme song, I believe, in season two. Um, yeah, that theme song and that, that intro track, it, it really set the, the tone for uh, the, the episodes. So, it was great. Um, and the Ghost in the Shell movies are also great. But it represents a, a, a Hollywood, well, Ghost in the Shell is not really Hollywood, but it represents a, a movie industry, animation industry, representation of um, cybernetic civilization, right? And so you have a cybernetic civilization where more humans are connected to the global World Wide Web, if you want to use that terminology, right? The global internet directly through their minds, right? And they at the same time have these artificial bodies, but these bodies look real, but they're realer than real, right? You have, um, you know, um, better muscles and better facial structure and better posture and everything than a natural human. And you can do things that a natural human can't do, right? And so uh, Ghost in a Shell is a very interesting piece of art that uh, not only talks about the societal implications of cybernetics and the merger of humans and machine, but what that means in terms of poverty, homelessness, um, health care, politics, power dynamics, the surveillance um, that goes on, you know, and how surveillance can evolve when you're able to go directly into a person's mind to investigate crime, to investigate fraud, and so on, right? And there are aspects of uh, Ghost in a Shell that would uh, make the movie Inception, starring Le Leonardo DiCaprio, look like child's play. We're talking about uh, not only the concept of Inception as shown in that movie, but going beyond Inception, where you have you know, inception, in inception, in inception. And they tried to depict that in the movie, but it's uh, treated much more uh, cleverly and uh, much more uh, in depth in the uh, animated series, uh, Ghost in the Shell. And it was situations where such inception events largely could only be detected by those with the most adept and uh, innate high IQs, right? So you would call them cybernetic prodigies, right? And they, they were about the only ones that could detect this. And if they were uh, what you might call quote unquote ordinary citizens or hackers, right? Either one, then that's one thing. But you also had cybernetic uh, law enforcement. You had you know members of law enforcement, military and special forces in Ghost in the Shell that also were cybernetic and they could hack into people's minds and bodies and other machines, right? And even amongst them, they had to work through different situations where they were going up against organized crime, right? Where they had to figure out, okay, am I really in a reality? Am I in the cybernetic reality? Or I'm in a, a supra or meta cybernetic reality that's superimposed upon the regular cybernetic reality juxtaposed with what you might call quote unquote the real world that we're in right now right so anyway i was heavy 
heavy into sci-fi and fantasy throughout the 1980s, the 1990s, and the, the, the majority of the 2000s and two, 2010s, right? Um, I have my father and mother to thank for that. Thank you, uh, father. Thank you, mother. Right? Um, my father uh, wanted to get me exposed to um, the first um, movie release of Star Trek when it was when it first came in theaters, right? And so that kind of dates me quite a bit. I was I was a, a little baby uh, watching Star Trek, uh, the motion picture, when it first came out, and um, you know, so I go all the way into um, Stanley Kubrick's work, right? Uh, 2001: A Space Odyssey. Uh, I go into Blade Runner. I go into all of that stuff. I, I go into just about it. Farscape, Babylon 5, uh, you name it, right? I'm heavy into that. I still have many of those um, productions on DVD or Blu-ray, and in some cases, 4K Blu-ray. I just don't watch it, watch them anymore, and I will tell you why uh, in a little bit. But, um, so, I've known so much about the genre of sci-fi that uh, I can't even remember what I forgot. <laughs> So, but one of my favorites was uh, Babylon 5, right? And how it relates to this discussion. Because um, I think it may have been the last episode of season four, if I'm not mistaken, where you had the last human on earth, right? And this last human, he was the last human on earth and he had just watched a, a like you might call it a video of the entire history of humanity, right? from ancient times all the way into a million years into the future where he is, right? And so he's watching this and he's, he's downloading all the knowledge of humanity into himself, right? And he's still a human being at this point. And he's on this long platform. Think of like the same platform that Charles Xavier is on in um, the uh, X-Men movies where you got that long platform that he travels down in his wheelchair to get all the way to the end. So then there's this dome, and then he has this little uh, head thing where he can, like, amplify his telepathic abilities, right? And so imagine that, right? So he's on a platform similar to this, but he's he's dressed in, um, um, like, this, this cloak-like uh, clothing, right? Um, and long story short, he does all of this, and he says some kind of mantra, some kind of, like, you know, um, uh, European styled mantra, right? Um, that's more Celtic. Uh, it gives you kind of that Celtic vibe about how, you know, he acknowledges uh, his ancestors, right? You know, and his head is shaven clean, right? And he's this clean shaven dude. I mean, no hair on his, you know, anywhere, right? So he turns into this ball of light, this, this energetic light body, right? this ball of light and this ball of light goes into what's called an encounter suit right and this encounter suit has a humanoid shape to it and he goes into this this uh th this 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 suit and then this thing comes up and it's a head right so this this spe specialized high-tech suit can hold his energetic essence and then he moves into a ship right so basically He's the, he's the, um, the next generation representation, along with all the other humans that have taken a similar journey, of the Vorlons in this, in this series, right? Um, and so he's like the Vorlons, and then he takes off in this ship that is like a combination of Vorlon and uh, Mimbari technology, right? It looks like it's like a cross-brand cross, uh, brand, uh, Vorlon Mimbari thing because the Vorlon ships were biotechnology, right? They were biotechnology. They were living ships that actually had their own personality and skin and everything, right? And they were hyper advanced. They had a telepathic connection with the, their primary, um, I wouldn't say owner because the Vorlons didn't see their ships as pets or as owners or anything like that, but they were like symbiotic in many ways. And then when the Vorlon uh, passed away or, some, or got killed, as we found out in one of the episodes, right? Um, earlier in the season, the ship would willingly, uh, you know, commit suicide by flying itself into a sun, a nearby sun, 
because it could not stand to exist apart from um, its partner. But anyway, so uh, this last human that's now transformed into this being of light that's now in this uh, three-dimensional uh, echo suit, you might call it, e exoskeleton, you know, but they call it an encounter suit, is flying into a portal into a wormhole to go out to the galaxy where the Vorlons long migrated to a million years ago. And so, um, and he's doing that because the sun in the Earth's solar system is on the brink of going supernova. So he waits until the last seconds of that supernova so that he can carry the memory of the last remnants of earth what they then call soul they, they call they renamed it soul right um, the rat last remnants of soul right before he goes into that wormhole and goes into hyperdimension where he can move to that other galaxy and join the other uh, transfigured humans right so um, so it's like okay Neuralink is it like a a, a piece of technology that we might see as a means to help achieve that. Well, that kind of dovetails with the concept of the metaverse, right? And so, you know, when I first heard about Mark Zuckerberg's metaverse and I saw like some of the, um, the, the demo footage and that sort of thing, um, I didn't mean to be a downer to others when I said I didn't think much of it, but you'd have to understand that I was spoiled by heavy immersion in sci-fi and fantasy. You know the matrix right i watched those movies i bought those movies i watched them over and over again i uh, watched star trek the next generation and all the star trek that predated that and came after that deep space nine shout out to captain cisco right in black history month count out the uh, shout out to uh, captain uh cisco but um you know the hollow deck right the concept of the hollow deck and you know and so when i say you know Hollywood you did your job too well you know because you know when you look at Tron Legacy I don't know if anyone's ever looked at Tron Legacy where you know if you're like a coder software developer type uh, like I am right where you know you know how to use Unix and Linux um, codes to um, you know log into machines remotely you don't need a GUI you don't need a mouse and point click you just type commands and go in there there's a scene in Tron Legacy where the uh, young young uh, son of um, the, the, the guy that went into the Tron universe or disappeared and I used to know these names of these characters but yeah I kind of like just let all that go but I remember the scene where he's sitting there entering these codes that his dad left as hints and he starts typing the codes and this thing behind him that's just like this tripod in front of me with a camera shoots a beam at him and dematerializes him and then rematerializes him into a material um, space right a true metaverse where he's now a computer program and he is surrounded by nothing but computer programs it's a deeply uh, imaginative story um, I like Tron legacy I like the original Tron I also have a copy of it but I just like the CGI and artistry and soundtrack I actually have the Tron legacy soundtrack it's pretty cool but well in a way I mean, when you think about how music actually is produced you might change your mind about that but anyway so you know it's like I was wondering with all of its um, flaws or with all of its um, what do you call that um, rough edges right it, when, when I'm talking about the the present metaverse technologies through the oculus or the Apple Vision Pro which I think is a much more refined version and is well ahead of um, the oculus but either way it's like okay could you use the metaverse right could you use the metaverse to uh, train the mind spiritually could you do that I mean that would be cool right like what if what if you could create your own spiritual universe right what if you created your own spiritual universe or spiritual environment that has all of the curated aspects of Tibetan bond Himalayan 
cultures and practices around the Himalayan, Himalayas. What if, you, what if you had something like that and you could start putting your mind on a kind of spiritual training wheels where you're in the ideal environment for meditation, you're in the ideal environment for meditation, you're in the ideal environment for practicing mantras and mudras and you name it, and you're able to do so in such a way where you're able to accelerate your spiritual development by being in the right virtual meta environment. You could create a digital version of Shangri-La. You could create whatever, right? Maybe you could create a transhumanist, uh, you know, resort, right? It could be a cross between Aspen, Colorado and Orange County, California, you know, whatever your pick is. But you could set up the conditions that are ideal for evolving. Oh, this is chicory root, by the way, that I'm mixing in with this cocoa powder that also is mixed with ashwagandha. Uh, chicory root actually accelerates digestion because it feeds the gut bacteria the right stuff, right? All of it's organic and non-GMO. But what if you could you could do that, right? Where you could create this ideal environment, right? To do that. So I thought about that. I was like, that might be a novel use of the metaverse technology. But um, then reality set in, or at least something that I considered, right? Have you ever heard about subliminal suggestion in music and movies, right? Have you ever heard of sub subliminal suggestion? where you can put in a subtract that you can't even uh, hear, right? But your subconscious mind can register, right? Or you can put suggestions, right? You can encode them and embed them. Now, according to uh, Dr. B. Sirius, who was an established record producer, right, in California, this sort of thing was done back in the what, late 80s, early 90s? I'm not sure of the time frame there. But at some point, uh, hip hop, for example, uh, was influenced with these subliminal tracks. It's kind of a huge discussion right now in certain circles about the uh, encoding of hip hop music and music in general, right? Where you have the 440 hertz um, uh, frequency, right? That the music is calibrated to wherein you have more sacred frequencies like 432 hertz, 528 uh, hertz, right, 93, uh, 936 hertz, and so on, that are better for uh, peace, the body, the DNA, the mind, so on. But you got these other frequencies that are used um, that um, help, you know, instill thoughts of, you know, loneliness, uh, depression, um, you know, hopelessness, or just makes you much more inclined towards, you know, violence in music, or uh, themes of lust, and um, what do you call it, hedonism, right, in the music. So, anyway, you just find Dr. B. Serious, he'll, he'll explain all of that, right? But I was like, what if you did that in the metaverse, right? What if you were able to encode subliminal suggestions in the metaverse, where it was like, hey, no matter how benevolent your intentions are in terms of your uh, your activities in the metaverse that your time spent in the metaverse would actually uh, make you even more receptive than even music alone right or movies alone right you can combine music and movies but what if you combine music movies animation 3d uh, you know experiences and you were able to encode uh, you know, messages right into the very uh, virtual images themselves that you can't identify, but nonetheless hits direct to your subconscious, your limbic system, and you don't have a conscious filter that uh, would help you uh, discern between what is good information and what is bad information that's being projected to you. So now I said, you know, in terms of like spiritual practice, the metaverse, we can rule that out. <laughs> Because you know, then you're 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 at war between your own spiritual um, 
progress, right? And this mechanism that you're trying to use for spiritual progress, right? Um, and so I was like, yeah, that, that just puts me back to my original uh, PhD spiritual thesis, which is the highest evolution will occur through the organic mechanism. But, you know, so because you're really talking about, you know, a, a matrix layered upon a matrix, right? And you're just getting a dopamine fix another way rather than uh, creating real solutions. And so, you know, what, what would you say would turn me off of some of these concepts? Well, I think that started when I uh, visited this website many years ago, many years ago, right? There was this website I used to go to because I used to read web articles a lot before I, you know, was on YouTube and social media. I was more of a person that would read a lot of books, read web articles, do a lot of research, write uh, articles, write up research, that kind of thing. So I ran into uh, Jay Dyer, his website, Jay's Analysis. And Jay's Analysis uh, is a website where Jay talks, he, he's a student of history and philosophy. And when I say he's a student of history and philosophy, we're talking PhD level. And um, he and I also has the same uh, religious um, background or origin, should we say. We both, um, you know, came to the same conclusions on that. Uh, independently, um, well, I would say that he's probably like a more of an input on that uh, for my part. But the thing is that uh, Jay uh, broke down uh, movies. He broke down movies. He broke down uh, books. He broke down TV programs. And he's the type of person that would find like the hidden meanings between uh, behind movies like The Matrix or uh, what is that called? Uh, is it Twin Peaks? Is that, is that what the TV show was called? Something like that. But he, he went into all these different movies and he, he would uh, explore, um, you know, the pros and cons and from a, an esoteric spiritual level, religious level, from a predictive programming level. You know, that's where I started learning about predictive programming, right? And so then I eventually read his book that he published, um, Esoteric Hollywood. After I read Esoteric Hollywood, I was pretty much done at that point. I was done. So... Um, I, I was finito uh, with the movies and the TV shows because um, he did scholarly work. This wasn't a work of opinion. He did scholarly work where he traced all the roots of many of the TV shows that people watch and found what was the, uh, the agenda behind many of the movies and TV shows. I won't recreate that dialogue here, right? But suffice it to say, um, I was just dropped one name, uh, R-A-N-D, the Rand Corporation, right? And so, yeah, back in, um, what, I forgot what year that was where I was learning about all this stuff, but maybe it was 2013, 2014, something like that. I was learning about the Rand Corporation, I was learning about all this stuff, I was like, oh, I see. So, anyway, so yeah, thank you, Jay, for, um, you know, solving my my um, my thirst for sci-fi and fantasy so basically what I saw was that um, you know not only through Jay's work but through others who um, uh, what do you say basically corroborated what he um, basically uh, expounded upon you know as far as independent research out there is that um, Everything that you think is new, that is brand new, was already made decades ago. Maybe not in a refined form, but in some rough form. Coconut water is the absolute best way, other than fruit, to be hydrated, to get hydrated. Because hydration is based off of electrolytes and essential minerals and nutrients. Water alone doesn't do it. So anyway, um, but yeah, so you look at um, the, the media's role in getting you comfortable with new technologies. It's a form of premeditated uh, marketing, right? 
So I haven't gotten to the good part yet. This is all just, uh, you know, the, the larger context, but we're almost there. So it starts with talking about brain augmentation. So brain augmentation, where you're gonna put a chip in your brain, all right, Neuralink in this particular case, because it's gonna be the, the likely candidate for that, right? And like I said, this is a time capsule. So if you're watching this 20 years from now, if YouTube is still a thing or somebody has reposted this and this type of content is allowed to uh, continue to um, propagate out, then know that um, if you blame us here in the past uh, for the things that do go wrong in the future, please know that on behalf of your ancestors that um, I acknowledge our guilt because we did know and we didn't always feel like we had anything to do with averting a future that uh, we saw as unwholesome and um, unproductive from a health and wellness and totality of being standpoint for uh, humanity. That's just how many of us were, right? That doesn't exclude us from our role in trying to make a change for the better, but know that, yes, we, we all knew in this society. So anyway, but um, think about uh, that function on your phone, uh, find food near me, right? You open up Google and you say, you type in uh, food near me. It uses location services to know where you're at, pinpoint your location, and then it identifies all the restaurants and other places you can eat and drink. Uh, that's uh, near you within a 50 mile radius, right? Um, and the results are sorted by those that are closest to you all the way up to those that are furthest from you. So imagine having a chip in your brain where that chip, right, uh, can circumvent that because, you know, well, my phone is right there, so I can't actually grab it and demonstrate it. But you no, know, you grab your phone and you got your, your muscles are involved. Your eyes are involved. You got to swipe up and swipe down. So your fingers involved. You got muscle movement there. You have to interpret what you're saying. You got to actually either type in or voice dictate food near me, right? And you have a couple of actions that are involved in that, right? Well, if the chips in your brain, you don't have to do any of that. You don't even have to do the Apple Vision Pro thing like this, right? You can just um, have an instant thought, and at the speed of light, everything you want to know is right there. And so when you have a brain chip, you have an immense amount of productivity and capability. When that brain chip is connected to Wi-Fi, you have even more capability. And when you combine Wi-Fi with ChatGPT style AI, or so-called AI, and watch my previous video for what AI really is, right? I, I, de I demystify um, the general concept of what is called AI. But anyway, when you combine these things, you have a thousand percent thousand times uh, increase in capability right and so that seems all well and good right okay but you have a couple of things that you need to consider with that right so first does it sound cool if everything you want to know you can know it in an instance you know you can have conversations with other people right directly in your mind. You don't have to move your lips. You don't have to move your voice. You don't have to do anything. You can have conversations at the speed of light. It's going to be like telepathy where you can control everything. If you want to turn on your car, you just think about your car turning on and it turns on. Um, you can be laying in bed about to go to work, right? If, even if you're, you know, if you're even going to work, you know, because a, a brain chip changes the whole definition of remote work, does it, does it not? Right, but it also changes the definition of home automation, where you can control the lights and the temperature and everything else in your crib, right? And so, all that sounds pretty cool, but, you know, does it come with a cost? Let's talk about the price. How much do you pay? How much do you really pay for this upcoming technology?
so the price the price is pretty high and Dr. Bobby Price says you should eat your nuts and seeds, right? Well, I'm not so much into the seeds, but I do like these pistachios. They're awesome. So we go back to the original question. Does this technology elevate humanity? Does it bring humanity to a new frontier in terms of the evolution of our being, our body, our essence? And what you have to look at it as that, what is the track record of the technologies that has been created? What's the track record? Well, the track record is that at least in the West, in the United States, and other countries that are modeled after the United States or whom the United States are modeled after because, yeah, Britain came first, right? But Britain, Spain, and, and uh, Portugal, they all came first. So, but anyway, it's like in that um, Eurocentric capitalistic model, right? Everything has to be, be a product. So when you have a chip in your brain, does parts of your brain become a product? Can a corporation lay claim to your thoughts? Can you sign a mental contract with a corporation in the future? See, today we call that intellectual property intellectual property and trade secrets and you know uh, intellect patents and all that kind of stuff intellectual property rights assignment many people in IT know that all too well many people in entertainment and media know that all too well right it's a seemingly benign concept but when applied in the digital realm it could take on a whole different aspect a whole different gravitas, you might say, right? Where all of your neurocircuitry, once you have that chip implanted in your brain, is now converted to a productive input for a, a corporation or for other moneyed interests, right? So, think about how we take aspects of nature and we try to uh, patent it for drugs right and you know you can actually say that yes I can get well and I can get healthy from nature itself right but the minute that some genetically modified seed flies through the wind and lands on another uh, farmers land right all of a sudden that farmer has to give up that land because someone owns the patent to that seed and in the same way you just naively or benignly encounter certain concepts thoughts media forms in your mind with this chip and all of a sudden your mind is now owned your mind and parts of your mind becomes real estate your mind now fully becomes colonized. So does Neuralink represent this in the future? Who's to say? The jury is still out. It is yet to be determined because we're not quite there yet in terms of the societal shift to a staunchly autocratic system. We're almost there. We are, we are definitely almost there. And I never would say, say things about this in the past. I do write about this on my blog. Uh, GaucherTalksLiving.wordpress.com. I have talked about this in the past, but since I've started doing videos, I've I've done far less writing. But I've written about all these ideas in the past. But anyway, the thing is that um, we're not at that turning point there, but we are hearing the rumblings of that. Whether we're talking about 
the uh, takedown of Russell Brand or the takedown of Andrew Tate, however you feel about him, right? But we're talking about, you know, uh, censorship and control, right? Um, when I looked at the interview with uh, Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin, yeah, I get around, I, I, you know. And so um, I learned a lot from that about, um, you know, what is the, the, the power behind the power, right? I already knew that stuff, but it, it's just, uh, it, it takes on a whole different life when you hear it uttered from certain mouths, right? And so, but much of that is going to appear to be a distraction. Much of what we're talking about today in 2024, early 2024, uh, Trump versus Biden, where we're talking about the migrant crisis versus reparations, right? Where we're talking about all this money going all the way out to wars, right? Hundreds of billions. Where here in this country there are people that um, are struggling, who are born here, but they might as well have been some people with some kind of uh, what do you call leprosy from from the biblical times, right? As if they don't really exist. Um, where all this money goes to all the wrong places and none of it comes to the right places and but with even all of that once this neural link gets set in colonization of the mind is going to take on a whole new level so no matter which side of this you are on whether you're red or you're blue or black or you're white whatever it is there is a looming situation that if folks don't get together in the right way it really will be game over because once a chip goes in here and you can influence the mind directly remotely well there you go you, you have the most advanced robot um, humanity uh, can ever see which is a human itself right you don't even need robots from China <laughs> You can turn human beings into robots. And, um, you know, more than that, it's one of those things where when you combine AI, genetic engineering in the food and in the bodies, right, with neurological technology, you know, you, you have a trifecta of control that many think that they will be ahead of that in the future because they are billionaires today they have the power today but there were many in Germany that thought they had that power overnight it was gone so it's like you have to be a student of history to a point but don't live in history but try to understand the lessons of history so that you are prepared for the future. That's why I don't spend a lot of time in doom and gloom. It's not my thing. I don't try to figure out the conspiracies and the Illuminati. I did read a thousand page book called The Perfectibilist. Um, I couldn't find it in print anymore for some reason. But anyway, um, so I've studied all that stuff. And then I came to the conclusion that just like aliens, it doesn't really matter. What matters is what actions you can take right now from a spiritual standpoint, right? Spiritual pragmatism. What actions can you take now from a sovereignty standpoint? Thank you, Seven Bomar, of the channel Understanding for bringing that to my consciousness. What can you do to establish personal sovereignty? Let me say that word right, sovereignty. Yeah, you know, a sovereign like a king or queen, right? Your own personal sovereign. What can you do to establish personal sovereignty? And so, um, that's really what it's all about. And some of these technologies are like a lure. They're like a lure, and you can get lured in if you don't use them right. And some of them, I've now reached a point where I can finally say they shouldn't be here at all. I mean, yes, you can use a chip to try to restore a person's uh, ability to walk, and you can do all kinds of stuff, but some things really are such a slippery slope 
because you you now have the awareness of um, the, the the human nature to not work within the uh, the, the right uh, ways of doing things, right? It's like, yeah, you got this chip that starts out doing this great thing, but you just know human nature. You know they're not going to do right. So it's like, you're better off not having it at all. So, I mean, it's not the same as the guns debate, right? I'm all for guns. I'm not actually a gun control advocate. Um, I don't think guns are evil. I think it's about the person that has the gun, right? So, you know, my political ideology is more about pragmatism. It's a true independent uh, ideology. I don't do uh, Republicans and Democrats because, you know, I don't see solutions uh, in parties like that. I don't see solutions at all. I see more problems. And so I think um, people being more independent and practical and realistic about what's right and wrong and what needs to happen is where things can get steered back in the right direction right and so that's my take on Neuralink and the future and um, if I triggered anybody or set somebody off in the wrong uh, way um, I truly do apologize for that and yet these are my views and I stand behind them and I won't talk about this uh, again and so that's why I spent so much time on this um, this is the most important video that I've done that is not so much of a vlog style video, but more of a conversation that I just want to put out into the ocean of the internet, social media, uh, for all it's worth. And so, if you have any response, reactions, or feedback, uh, do like the video, whether you liked it or not, if the information at least you thought was um, uh, thought provoking. Uh, subscribe, you know, so um, you can uh, hear some more stuff for me sometimes I put out some good stuff sometimes I put out some stuff like that nah. but you know it, it's uh, things that I see as uniquely um, interesting in the world and uh, but if you want to have a conversation about this I will engage with you in the comments if you drop a comment I will follow up and uh, we can carry this conversation forward but until then have a great rest of the week great rest of the month and may 2024 be prosperous for us all. Thank you.